All right, back with another project here. I've got a waterfall diorama. This is different from what you're used to seeing on this channel. Usually I've got a waterfall with uh, actual real water working and uh, just decided to do something different and working at a very small scale and using a two-part resin uh, to create this uh, fake water. So creating a scale where it's, uh, it's so small, the detail was uh, quite challenging, but I needed to do something different. So creating a look there is as if it's like a morning uh, sunshine, but here's how it looks with normal lighting. So there's a little bit of depth uh, to that lake. I think it's actually uh, an inch deep, but with the painting, with the paint job, it makes it look uh, hopefully a little deeper or much deeper than that. Uh, so, fun project, uh, autumn-themed, small uh, gray rock waterfall. All right, I'll even show you how I created this little border, this little crude border that goes around it. So, let's go ahead and get started in creating this small waterfall diorama. All right, you want to make sure that you are building this near an, an open window, because I'm going to be using some hot wires from the Hot Wire Foam Factory couple of different wires, one that is flexible, one that is more like a knife. So, and you want to make sure that you are wearing a uh, professional gas mask. For years I was using that white, uh, not so professional uh, mask to protect you from the dust, but very important to use as good a mask as you can. So cutting out uh, the base and wound up making this base two layers thick of that, I guess, three quarters inch uh, polystyrene. So drawing out a design for the lake and using the flexible hot wire to try to create this sloping uh, look down towards the, uh, the bottom of the lake. So it wound, winds up being uh, close to an inch deep. And creating the trees, so I'm using actual parts of uh, real trees or bushes and just gluing together uh, sections of these. And then uh, once that is dry, trying to uh, trim some of the branches and then applying some glue and later then applying uh, regular model railroad uh, foliage. So just building up the uh, look of this, layers of glue and then layers of uh, this model railroad foliage. And then once that is dry, using a combination mixture of water and essentially white glue uh, to cover the entire thing, what this will do will harden it and it'll create quite a bit of texture that uh, you can later dry brush and uh, essentially change the color of the tree. So since I'm going for uh, the fall season, so I'm dry brushing on sort of a muted yellow and so all of that texture from the dried up glue uh, will pull off just little bits of uh, color sort of leaving that negative space uh, to act as uh, shadows so it's a little bit time consuming to get the tree to actually look right and here uh, i've got a red tree with some orange highlights so I wound up uh, creating quite a few of these little trees. Ended up, I think, creating maybe seven more besides what you see here. And going ahead and trying to carve out more of the landscape to build up around that lake. Trying to create some like subtle, I guess, differences in the topography. So moving the styrofoam around, trying to uh, find out you know what the design is going to look like so I've got some dead plant here and putting it into a coffee grinder trying to create some ground cover so you can use all kinds of things I wound up using just foam coat uh, but a lot of people use sawdust uh, later I ended up using uh, dead leaves so putting this through a straining uh, process to try to get uh, the smallest uh, scale. So I've got a net there catching it. 
And then what I'm going to do is put this into a little container that is filled with uh, various colors of acrylic paint. So I'm going to mix this together to try to completely saturate whatever it is you're using the particles, either sawdust or ground up uh, dead leaves. Spreading this out onto wax paper and then putting it back into this process of uh, uh, straining it and trying to uh, create smaller particles. You can always just, once it's dried, put it back into the coffee grinder. And here I've got dead leaves. So you can crumple these up and put it through the same process. So mixing together a whole bunch of different shades uh, one at a time of uh, various shades of what grass will look like. So prominent green and shades of dead grass and like yellow. And so that's what I'll end up doing later in the project just so you have a reference point creating the ground cover. So here I've got a whole bunch of gravel. Just went outside to an area, asked if I could get uh, a baggie of all this gravel. And so sifting, trying to separate various scales Got three different scales there. And of course, at this scale, some of those rocks would actually be of the scale of a boulder. So, needing another layer, just tracing around that first uh, piece to create a second layer. So, going ahead and gluing down those two pieces. Sometimes putting the trees on there to get a reference point of how this is looking, you know, where should things be cutting out uh, that piece that the, the waterfall falls over and using a razor blade to cut out an indentation at the top there. And that is the piece that I'm working on, again, just to give you a reference. Then using a razor blade to create some texture and cutting it at uh, sometimes different angles. So all of that texture will start to show up when I start uh, the paint job then doing the uh, dry brush uh, paint job. So gluing down the rest of the landscape that is built up around the lake and going ahead and cutting out the main uh, reservoir for the river up top and drawing out where the extension of the river is going to be and then using the hot wire to uh, go ahead and gouge out uh, the shape of the river. Going ahead and gluing down those two pieces. So I noticed uh, quite a few gaps and uh, other areas that needed to be uh, smoothed out a little bit. Sometimes you can just use glue uh, in uh, trying to smooth out some of these areas and get it to look uh, seamless. And then with this, just using uh, smaller pieces of styrofoam and plugging that in with glue. So some of the rocks or boulders uh, that I created were, were just pieces of polystyrene. So just showing you can use either uh, all styrofoam or gravel to create that uh, look of those, uh, of those rocks. So here, this piece right here, sort of a projection of rock through the landscape. Just to give you reference, that's where we're at as far as the finished product. And creating that path that uh, goes into the forest. So just drawing that out and then creating just a little bit of an indentation with the hot wire. And then just kind of working out of order and creating some rock slabs that go on top there. Using essentially a white glue, I'll have all of the materials in uh, the description below. We're going to mix together a little bit of this white glue and water to create kind of a, uh, uh, in place of a mortar, because I didn't use a mortar like grout or foam coat. And so to toughen up the project a little bit, uh, covering all of this with a layer of watered down glue, but especially to in the areas where the lake and the river up top, they need to actually be able to hold uh, that product of, of fake water, the resin. So this needs to be watertight. So I need to seal these, 
these two areas. I have a really thin uh, piece of polystyrene. I'm going to cut this into uh, little strips and then putting them together is just an easy way to create a whole bunch of rocks uh, at the same time. So if you're not wanting to use gravel, just make sure that you cut off the uh, you know, the edges so they don't look like little boxes that you've cut out. And going ahead and gluing uh, some of those in place. So using a mixture of uh, real rocks and little polystyrene rocks. So doing a test, water test to see if there are any issues. And noticed on the right side here, there's a little projection of water where so later what I'll do is build that area up with uh, gravel just to sort of block the water from uh, making that unnatural, I guess, projection. I'm going to go ahead and uh, cover all of this in sort of a base dirt color. So just a general uh, dark beige covering everything. Even though most of this will be covered up, you really don't want some of that white of the polystyrene uh, showing through. Then going ahead and uh, doing some underpainting again with a uh, black wash. So what I'm doing is trying to make sure that the cracks of the rocks uh, show through. And uh, this just basically with the black wash will fill in all of those gaps. And then all of that texture that I did with the razor uh, will show through when I dry brush this. So it kind of looks like I took a blowtorch to it. So at this point, fixing, trying to fix that projection of water that went out towards the right. So just filling that area with uh, various size of really small gravel. And uh, at the top portion, doing the same thing, but really just for looks. And then using a mixture of water and glue to mat this down, glue this uh, entire thing down, making sure that all those little uh, pieces of gravel are, are stuck. Doing another water test, and you can see with that addition of gravel, there's no longer that little projection of water going out towards the right. So now I'm going to go ahead and continue doing some painting and doing some dry brushing, so removing most of the color, most of the paint on the brush onto a paper towel, and then just uh, dry brushing certain areas, doing a lot of layers, a lot of uh, different shades of uh, basic stone earthy colors. So trying to vary it where I've got a little bit of a highlight color and but not covering all of uh, the rocks so going back in and with this uh, having like a really uh, light color almost like a bleached rock look and then mixing together uh, some green and some blue to try to create that aqua for the paint job for uh, the uh, actual lake and this was quite challenging trying to get this uh, color right and to try to get the blend where it goes from a dark uh, aqua to like a sandstone. So here's a way of saving your paint, in case you don't know, spraying the acrylic paint and putting it into a baggie. Uh, save it, it'll enable it to be saved for hours. So mixing together here some aqua and basically a land or sandstone color to try to uh, help with this uh, challenge of trying to fade from one color to the next. And uh, what I've got here is I took a picture of uh, that lake filled up with actual water to try to figure out where the water line is. So what I'm going to try to do is paint a little bit above where I know the water line is going to be and painting it with the color of the rocks that are underwater. So having this color painting just above the waterline of all of the areas that I know are going to be underwater. And then later what I'll do is just once after the resin is cured, go back in and paint the tops of the rocks, the rocks that are halfway in the water and halfway uh, sticking out of the water. 
painting them, you know, a natural rock color. So we've got quite a few different uh, colors going on there, dark um, aqua blending into a lighter aqua and did several layers, wasn't really happy with the paint job, kept going back and forth and uh, all the while checking um, reference photos and trying to here, realizing that I really didn't have that kind of bright aqua color that I had wanted from seeing some of the reference photos. So trying to blend sometimes with just water in between two colors that hadn't dried yet. And then finally realizing that it worked better if you just dry brush, uh, in this case, that color of what you want the rocks to look like when they're underwater, dry brushing that on top of uh, the land color. So I went back and forth on this quite a bit, but finally wound up where I was somewhat satisfied. What I'm doing here is just trying to seal everything because everything needs to be watertight before I pour the resin because you don't want to waste resin, of course. Uh, it can be rather expensive. So, and be sure and watch this intermission. I talked a little bit about this subject in the Canyon Diorama where I went over how I thought it was believable that a canyon developed by accident over time with nothing guiding it but random chance. The same thing could be said for any landscape, such as a waterfall. You have a giant boulder, maybe, that falls from a higher point or an asteroid that hits the earth, creating a dip in the surface level. Water collects in that reservoir. Other random rock landscapes crumble and fall to collect in an area right next to the lake created. A big rock hits above to make another indentation where, again, water finds its way and fills up the upper portion. That upper portion catches water from a higher elevation point during the rainy season and boom, you have a waterfall. All essentially small, random, purposeless changes over time that happen to create a scene most people would agree is beautiful and or majestic. No mind was required or decisions that had to take place in order for these unpredictable events to happen. And yet when you look at the human body, forget about all the complexity and focus on the idea that random mutations in a living creature could never have made the decisions that had to have happened in order for certain features such as eyesight to come about. The point of this video is to really ask the question of what is more likely? Accidental design that is somehow more advanced than what our most impressive computers or robotics to date can do? Or that a mind had to be involved? With the two examples given, creation of a waterfall and creation of a human, evolution provides the same explanation for you as it does for the waterfall. Small, random, without purpose, mindless changes over time that happen to create something. Usually the response to this is, that's just the God of the gaps argument, which is basically just because there are problems or gaps in the theory of evolution doesn't mean God is responsible. Or just because we don't understand something doesn't mean we should have God fill that gap and explain it that way. I think if you use the words intelligent design at first instead of God, it might sound different. I think there's a lot of people who have, for whatever reason, developed a bad image in their mind when they hear the word God. If he exists, why did he let this happen? And other questions like that. I'm just trying to get you to think of this in a different way and get you to truly examine unbiased logical thinking when approaching this subject matter. I mentioned robotics earlier. Look at what's been produced lately. You can find some videos on the web. Fairly impressive what humans have been able to make with robotics, and yet it pales in comparison to what random mutations through the evolutionary process has supposedly made. Doesn't this make you think? Highly intelligent humans are not able to make anything even remotely comparable to what nothing supposedly made. I know some of you will still invoke the idea of God of the Gaps, but I think at the end of the day when you truly examine unbiased logical thinking concerning this subject, it doesn't add up to being on the side of random, purposeless chance. I know this doesn't go towards proving Jesus Christ is the only way, truth, and life, as I believe him to be. 
But sometimes you need to start with taking that step towards realizing intelligent design is the only logical conclusion one can make to explain our existence, and then move forward towards pursuing God from that point. Another way of thinking of the God of the gaps is that once science has made a discovery and explained something, the idea is we no longer need God to explain that particular mystery. The problem with that is even if the field of robotics, for example, were soon able to replicate the human body in all its capacity, it would still be surprising that it took this long for intelligence to produce what supposedly lack of intelligence and random chance succeeded at. We with our intellect are having to catch up and are struggling with replicating what apparently non-intelligence has produced. Just as a mind is required to make all of the decisions it takes in the field of robotics, so is a mind required to make the thousands more decisions it took to produce a human. Please think about this. Heaven and hell are very real places. As I've said in other videos, don't you owe it to yourself to find out where you may or may not wind up upon leaving this world. Thanks for listening. So here we've got... A crude little mock-up so before I pour resin into a project that I've worked just hours and hours on it's probably a good idea to create this little mock-up or a mock-up of whatever you're building if you're going to be using resin just to see how the product works you know what is this uh, gonna be like uh, can you learn anything from doing this and you notice that the reservoirs are rather small so I'm not gonna waste uh, product but with this cup, with those lines, it's basically a way of guessing how much product I'm going to have to pour into those little reservoirs. So I guess, and then according to the line, like with this example, I've got a little bit left over. So the next guess, I'm going to have uh, less water in the cup. And you just keep going back and forth until you've got, you know, a fairly accurate idea of how much product it's going to take uh, to fill those reservoirs. So here with the the test piece mixing together and I'll have the, the list of all of the materials in the description basically follow the directions as a two-part resin and uh, so mixing up enough but not too much so that you're wasting product and so it turned out how I thought it was going to turn out. So on to the actual project, going to tape up or block uh, the beginning of that river up top and make sure that it is uh, sealed from uh, the front and the back. So you don't want every anything leaking out. So doing another water test here and noticing that it does have a leak using the old plumber's trick with uh, paper towel. So going back in and making sure that it is all sealed up. And doing another water test, and this time there were no more leaks. So moving on to guessing how much product it's going to take to fill up those uh, two reservoirs. So going back and forth and finally coming up with what I know, you know, is going to be a an accurate guess. So I'm mixing together the actual product here, filling up the lower portion first, and then going up top. Realized that it was, when I built this thing, it was not on a completely perfectly level surface. So popping some bubbles here, will be just a few bubbles that uh, happen. You want to get rid of those before uh, it completely cures, so it left it to uh, cure for a couple of days outside. And uh, so, because it wasn't built on a perfectly level surface, I've got this issue where there really wasn't much product towards the back. So using a different product that'll be in the description where you can build up water uh, in a different way where it's, it doesn't you know pour at all. It's basically like a glue, uh, but it dries perfectly clear. So going in and uh, applying a little bit of water and glue to uh, the landscape and first applying a dirt uh, layer. So I've got basically a brown 
uh, dirt layer that covers everything. And as I mentioned before, working out of order. So I'm going to start to try to paint uh, some of the rocks. So this is what I was talking about with painting uh, the part of uh, some of these boulders that are sticking out of the water. So you've got that color, you know, below the resin and above, and you're going to try to differentiate by, uh, you can really see it right here with this rock that is halfway in the water and halfway out. So it just adds another little detail to the, uh, the piece, it makes it more believable. So here adding uh, glue and water and going to start applying the ground cover. So mixed up or created a whole bunch of different variations of color for the ground cover for, to create the grass. And so a lot of uh, dead grass uh, color, then blending yellow and, and green to, uh, I think I had four or five that I ended up using to try to create the realistic look of that ground. And then used uh, some twine and some yarn to create some tall grass. So here's some green yarn and ended up using some twine. And basically what I'm doing is trapping the base of those fibers. And uh, then after it's dried, pulling that up and you've got some tall grass or weeds that you can apply uh, to the layout. So just adding a little bit of glue then to the base and sticking those uh, in place. And that's how they're looking in the, uh, the final version. And then adding uh, some grass here and there to that rock uh, area to uh, give it some depth. Applying some glue and then adding some actual rocks, some gravel, and soaking up the excess glue with a little bit of paper towel. And then adding uh, random small gravel, small rocks here and there just to create uh, more detail. Adding some glue to that path that ends up going into the woods and sprinkling a little bit of really light ground cover on that path. And then once that's dried, you can go back in and just dry brush that path with a very light beige just to really make that, uh, that path stand out. So I'm going to try to measure uh, the length of what the waterfall is going to be. And using uh, the same product I used to build up the, the beginning of the river, uh, which will be in the description. So just uh, applying that to wax paper, and you can use uh, water to get rid of that or remove that wax paper easily. So there that little piece is, but I'm going to try to build that up even more to create more uh, depth to the actual falls and create a lot more texture. And then placing that once it's dried onto a little piece of uh, plastic. So cutting that little piece of clear plastic, flexible plastic out, and then uh, rolling one of the edges so as to uh, simulate a little curve that'll be at the top of the waterfall. So what this is really doing is adding stability to that little piece so that once it dries, it's not, it's going to be less likely to start uh, warping and uh, more likely to keep its shape. So there you see it at the base there. Just one extra thing to help keep that little piece of dried plastic uh, in position. So cutting the top there to measure it out correctly and using some of the same stuff uh, at the base and the top uh, to glue it down. And taking uh, some of it to try to blend it in with uh, what it's supposed to be a part of, which is the ending of that river. So taking another product and trying to create some rapids, some fast rapids, at the top here. So this will all dry clear, uh, but trying to create texture that I will later use uh, with white acrylic to dry brush. So here practicing creating ripples uh, for the uh, lake, so the lower portion. 
good idea just like with the resin to uh, create a little uh, piece that you don't care about that you can practice uh, creating ripples in this case but what I ended up doing is uh, really not doing a good job here and uh, ended up going back in and fixing it but trying to in some cases create like individual ripples you can see right there it just doesn't look right so what I did was went back in and covered like an entire section with this product which is a high gloss or a gloss uh, glue that dries clear so covering an entire section and then kind of pulling the brush towards myself to create uh, these little ripples throughout. So all of that section is, is covered and instead of leaving these little gaps where there's, there's nothing uh, covering the surface. And it just made it look uh, way better, or at least in my opinion it, it did. and dry brushing the falls. And I used uh, this pen quite a bit. I couldn't, I didn't have a brush that was small enough to create these little dots. So knew I wanted to have a whole bunch of uh, very small detail and the dry brushing really wasn't uh, doing that. And so a pen here creating little, uh, little white dots, but important step is to create some shadows in the waterfall so instead of having the waterfall look like just a white sheet coming down having these little shadows which is basically an acrylic uh, grayed out dark blue to sort of break up and give the uh, waterfall some form so here painting that top part that sort of break point when the water starts to foam uh, from the river and down into the actual falls again using the pen and uh, using the dry brush technique again so really making sure at this point that I've got most of that paint off of that brush so I'm going to be trying to bring out some of the texture that was created uh, in the lake portion So this is just something I was, I was really careful with uh, to not have this uh, be pr too prominent and making sure that it faded and uh, there was less uh, dry brushing or detail as I moved away from the waterfall. And then going back in with a small brush to create some detail, sort of to try to break up that pattern that ended up uh, being created from the dry brush. So just creating little ripples that might stand out a little bit better. Then dry brushing the uh, river portion, so the top portion there, applying a lot more to that evenly than to the lake at the bottom. And going in and putting in some detail of a water line here and there with the, with the rocks with the pen. So applying with the pen and then with the pen trying to remove most of it. And there's just a little bit left behind to give that suggestion that you've got the water uh, interacting with that rock. And building up uh, the waterfall just to build up that form. Uh, towards the top so that's the same stuff that I used to create the waterfall itself and then down towards the base to try to cover up uh, that piece of plastic so again going back in and with the uh, the pin and with the brush trying to dry brush and add more detail so got the same product that created the ripples uh, on the lake covering both the top portion and the bottom with this with a very thin layer uh, because this is a gloss glue that will dry clear with the gloss to try and reestablish that wet look because the acrylic paint will dry dull and uh, you're trying to make it look like water so you really need to add something that will reestablish that look of it being uh, wet. So time to add the trees. 
So I'm using a much thicker pen to drill a hole and then add some glue into that hole and then add the tree. So, and you can, you know, play around with this and come up with different variations as in like setting a tree on there and trying to figure out where you actually want the trees to be permanently glued in. So using a little bit of another model railroad uh, foliage product, slightly different color and randomly uh, gluing in some bushes, adding some, some small rocks and then have a little piece of cotton here to try to simulate uh, the uh, mist at the bottom. So I added some glue onto the surface there and then matted that down, waited for that cotton to dry and then with the, uh, some tweezers sort of pulling up on the fibers of the cotton to try to simulate that mist. And then going over the entire project with a uh, sealant and just to try to glue everything into place. Usually I use a uh, spray bottle but thought this was just too small and delicate of a project and so I just covered it uh, with a brush and then in doing that you're uh, creating a very uh, rough texture that you can later then go dry brush in this case to try to uh, simulate the look of fallen leaves so all of that texture from the dried up glue uh, will just take off a little bit of the paint here and there to try and make it look as if there are uh, fallen leaves from those trees. And here's uh, what I did to create that border. So I've got balsa wood and I'm just going to measure around the sides as to uh, the form and shape and then go ahead with uh, an X-Acto knife and, and cut that out. and sand some of the uh, rough edges that resulted. And what I ended up using to stain it was coffee. And what I would recommend is using instant coffee because it basically dissolves in water perfectly. You don't get all those granules. And I think I added uh, four to five layers to try to get that deep uh, brown look and then adding as a last stage a uh, layer of sealant couple layers of sealant on each piece and gluing those into place and so what ended up happening there's quite a bit of warping because it was balsa wood so what you can do is uh, put this up against a wall or what I've done here is glue and then a couple of different sets of weights and you can uh, completely fix that issue of it warping so there you have it, waterfall diorama. Be sure and check out the intermission if you did not get a chance to watch that. And thanks for watching.